Imagine standing at the forefront of each technological revolution, witnessing groundbreaking innovations unfold right in front of your eyes. That is exactly what Vignesh Kumar has witnessed in his decades of experience working in the tech industry. In this conversation, I'll be discussing with him the history of Gen AI, the interesting innovations happening in the space, and a very interesting topic of quantum computing that is set to change the world in the coming days. Currently, Vignesh is working at Cisco and he has amazing knowledge of the cutting edge generative AI space. But what is even more interesting is his way of explaining complex tech terms in an easy to understand way. This is the fourth episode of the Mike and Shorts podcast powered by Buzzly. Let's get started. Hi, Vignesh. Welcome to the Mike and Shorts podcast. Hi, Divinash. Great meeting you here and it's, it's, it's a pleasure being here. Fantastic. So, and it's been, it's been a uh, long time since I've been uh, you know, planning to get you on the on the podcast because I've been following you for, for so long. And what I feel is that uh, since you have been in the tech industry for for decades, I think you've been there for years and years and you've seen the tech space evolve at a pace that, you know, most of us have not really seen, right? You've seen things uh, come up from like the ground up, right? Working at Cisco and other tech firms before that. I feel that you can add that perspective into technology and more specifically, I would say AI, generative AI and AI um, from a lens that we have not looked at. So I think in a previous yeah. conversation, we had talked about the fact that we can touch upon the history of AI because it's something very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the history has played a huge role uh, in terms of where we are today and where we are headed as well. Mm -hmm. And based on your experience, yeah. you've gained, right? the experience you've mm -hmm. gained uh, across the years and worked on so many projects, right? You're also working on the cutting edge technologies which are kind of shaping the future right now at, even at your company, Cisco. So, uh, on that note, sir, I would, would give it to you and you can give a brief introduction about yourself. Tell about what journey you've had as a tech veteran and then we'll deep dive into AI. So, it's been around two decades now and um, we are sure if you if you look at my journey, it it was it was a very traditional sort of a journey, right? Like it's about getting into your engineering, wrapping up your engineering, getting into. I did my engineering in mechanical, uh, but by second year I was preparing my G N I T along with my uh, my uh, engineering because for the simple reason that I slow, somehow felt that uh, I got interested in solving the, the the problems from a uh, what is it coding perspective right it was uh, I, it, it all started with uh, uh, like say the first year of your college where you're like trying to learn the C++ codes and uh, C++ C codes and then slowly you 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 realize that uh, there is a new area that everyone is talking about because I'm I'm going back way back in 1999 2000 sort of time frame so uh, at that time, uh, uh, for us, it was very important uh, to learn some new skill sets. And at that time, it was uh, about coding. So when I wrapped that up is when uh, I got into my uh, my first job. As such. I got placed in uh, Polaris Software Labs and I was doing my, uh, I, I got into the C++ Unix, Unix C++ domain. So the, the black screen guy, black and white screen guy is what we used to be calling ourselves. So that's where actually it all started. Like if you look at it, why uh, why did I, still people ask me like, why did you choose mechanical? Then you went to, uh, why did you land up your first role or job in some other industry? Uh, that, that's precisely, uh, I, I really didn't plan or I didn't write any script that this is how it is going to happen. It's more or less uh, how things just panned out. Uh, I saw an opportunity where my reasoning, problem-solving mindset could be leveraged. And uh, I jumped in there and uh, as they say, rest is history. Because once you are done three to four years of coding, uh, you, you, you start understanding the ecosystem. I think that is what it is all about. Like whatever language of coding, 
be it anything be it java be it the legacy ones like c c++ or even the or even the latest ones like python and all the foundational elements of any coding or programming is all about translating a problem looking at a problem finding a way to solve it mathematically if it is there then you try to put it in a in a type of a code and logical gates or loops and if conditions and that all those remain the same right so that's how i started um and it evolved i think as i said uh that became like my bedrock on which i i entered the tech world and after that it was like uh, subsequently i understood that unless tech is more of an enabler let's be very honest tech is an enabler it is not like a compelling function today if i just come and say divyansh i have a fantastic software i don't think you're going to readily take over the software unless you know why the software exists what what is it that it is solving how is it enhancing your productivity or making life easier for you so net net tech comes as an uh, in solving issues and uh, helping you so that is the reason i pivoted towards uh, business side because that's where uh when i did my post graduation i could understand that um every problem that we have in uh, in the business landscape or be it in uh, the current world can be in some way influencing the way we are thinking about technology i mean we couldn't connect 6.5 billion people so we said social media social platforms all these are internet every so you think about it right like every technology is about getting things uh, together and helping people to so that's why the business element came in uh, i i worked out uh, from that lens started uh, i got into consulting after my p school so that again gave me a good flavor of what uh, problems are uh, currently available i mean the clients are facing and it slowly me- helped me into get uh, get myself into the big com- uh, like uh, multi uh, national companies work for multiple companies different roles right from product development to product management to experiencing even sales so it it was i have never said no to any roles that i have got if i if it's there to something to learn i have went in and uh, tried to learn something there so that's how i put my journey how i basically moved across the last two decades uh, in tech interesting and you know uh, from what you said about being a tech person being a coder right starting with that and then getting into business i would like to know because it's been so many years for you in this space what excites you about tech i know it's an enabler like that's the main thing first how what does what's the main thing that excites about technology second how do you stay updated on tech i'm asking this question because people who will be listening from the angle say of a founder or somebody who is just starting out as uh, a newbie in tech how do you mm-hmm. stay updated and then probably how do you mm-hmm. evolve to become a leader as well like because that angle okay. that perspective is needed yeah i think i'm slightly a bit old school in this uh, uh that i i i see that um, there are a lot of quick fix sort of uh, recommendations that keep coming these days like you can become uh, proficient in this in 15 days 20 days 50 days i mean i see so many such um, initiatives are out but i strongly always believe that if especially for people who want to start or pivot their careers or get into something new uh, you can't enter a new space just by being a very superficial player so let me take an example and give you a, a where i'm going so see today if you i mean let me take the most spoken about tech thing in the world today So let's take an example that uh, we are talking about uh, AI related stuff. Yes, you can always look at it from what the applications of AI are and what is happening, uh, what are the current uh, uh, like scenarios that's really being worked upon etc. But unless and until you appreciate the the foundation so I don't I'm not saying that you need to go and become an expert coder and you should you should really of the 20 years that you are talking Uh, but the fact is there are some foundational basic things that we really need to understand and appreciate so that we can basically uh, we can go ahead and build that capability that is available in the market example if you have no idea about coding and you have never done any coding in the in your life it puts a 
slight I, you you are at a disadvantage when someone is going to talk about some of the algorithms example you might not become a data scientist and you might not be speaking at their levels at what the llm models are doing what is the different trades have uh, what are the different uh, training initiatives that they are doing etc but if you don't even know the software life cycle i mean if you don't even know how uh, code is even drafted how does it look how do, how is it even compiled you don't even understand the word compilation libraries check in check outs it becomes so much you know tougher for you to visualize what the end product is being case to and that is where i have slightly a problem and people come and say that hey i want to learn ai in 6 weeks or 6 months whatever the time uh, i mean you by all means start there you can always start by learning your current one i want to learn ai so that will lead into okay what are the tools that we use to develop ai it will take you to nlp it will take to deep learning then what you you'll catch one area right okay nlp is one okay let me go deeper and see what's it okay let me learn python let me go so it's a logical way for you to go somewhere deeper so that you are connecting the dots end to end and consistently that is a life cycle that is across multiple if you understood yeah. one life cycle like say how uh, like nlp works how python code is written what are the types of uh, like what are how do you put together a code then what happens is you can replicate it across multiple domains or other areas that you now you can think okay now this was nlp what how can it be on say deep learning how can it be on say any models which are on llm lam so slowly you can start building your uh, additional layers of knowledge but if you are superficial okay let mm-hmm. me learn today nlp tomorrow let me learn lam third rag fourth llm fifth say edge ai you are just yeah. basically taking five or six buzzwords it yeah. will look well to uh, show you or uh, i mean make you feel as if you know everything but right. by the second or third question people will start figuring it out if i start asking like hey how did you train the model yeah. did what was how did you factor in the bias that comes in what methods did you use to eliminate them uh, was it a supervised or was it like self learning or was it zero shot so, so you see how it goes right like you when you go deeper and deeper by the third question you should become uncomfortable mm-hmm. rather than that you would want to focus on one where you at least have seven to eight layers of information right become an expert there and since if you don't have a coding or a tech background this could be the template on which you replicate got it and, okay. yeah and for others who are always who who are like uh, uh, who have coded who have always been techies it's it's about how deep you want to go because uh, it's it's not it's not again about how fast you want to become expert it's about how deep you want to go and catch hold of what's what's under the hood sort of it's a very interesting uh, piece of information and advice you gave because you know a uh, lot of the folks are in a hurry to learn about ai to just get into dive into ai and you know uh, learn from a superficial perspective and learn from uh, just give have an overview of the world and you know they showcase that they are an expert but yeah diving deeper getting to the basics is something which is very relevant and important it's going to be relevant forever like diving deeper and getting to the basics yes. on that note sir i think uh, let's get into the aspect of ai because uh, you've talked about the fact that you need to to learn the basics and go deep when was it for you that you went deep into ai and when was it that you were introduced to ai and i think you've been there for long so you must have been introduced much before so so as i, I think ai burst into the scene uh, for i mean if i look at the scale of the buzz when it started right? like it is for many people they'll still recollect it like 2023 because it is like gen ai came into picture the moment chat gpt came in it was like uh, it was like as if ai was born last year okay. <laughs> and uh, mid journey uh, when it created the text to image it was like as if oh, this is now ai but i think that is where we get serious right we uh, as technical people uh, we might have to just go back and correct some of these misconceptions that it's not that ai was born last year a form of ai which is gen ai was born, oh, maybe born last year okay so that is what we need to how we need to differentiate ai has been with us i think uh, the first conference on artificial intelligence if i'm correct was in 1950s or something 
Yes. Uh, okay. It was a Dartmouth conference or something. Correct. Was way back in 1950s when, yes. uh, because see, if even before going and telling artificial intelligence, I think about it in this way, right? Like the Vyansh, what do you term as intelligence? I mean, we even before going ahead and telling, hey, this is AI, we were even struggling with intelligence at that point. Because yes. end of the day, intelligence is about uh, if you practically break it down into the raw bare minimum things, right? It is about the ability to think through a particular problem and finding an innovative way to solve. Yes. And you will have multiple layers to evaluate it. It's th- those are input mechanisms. Even when our brain is processing, then the human AI or sorry, human intelligence, if you want to call, it is about you sense so many things around you, right? And you you, you yeah. basically are consuming all that data as input, and your brain is taking that deep thought process where you're figuring out what could be a viable practical solution. I, I, I mean. Then you you go ahead and put together a, a set of output. Uh, that is what are your tasks. So AI is not something that came uh, just because of Gen AI buzz. So even if I have to look at my own journey, right? Like I still remember the first time. I'll not go into the details of work because generally I'll talk outside what projects I have always worked. But let me give you an example, right? 20 years back, if you are sitting on a module uh, in one of the projects that I was, there were error codes which were thrown randomly by the system, okay? And we basically, as uh, as a young group of people, were told to collect all those error codes and go into the respective libraries of those codes where the errors were coming in and put together very intelligent reasons why something... Example, if your stock is today not... Uh, get, getting executed and then when you're submitting it and you say uh, your a, a error code comes in we used to tell that hey you know what you have basically uh, entered a price which is nowhere related to the stock ticker and this is that is why it is it is showing incorrect or your currency value is incorrect for this particular stock exchange now in the past it, it could be a machine error because when it was trying to compute it within the binaries it threw a gibberish short of a error code and as a group of four or five techies we created a lot a library or laundry list of it put it in the right place and when the user saw it the user felt as if the machine was talking to them okay so it was like as if the machine telling hey uh, so and so no name but it was a generic message like hey you're you're incorrect here you you might want to check it and that was like an aha moment when we were compiling when we were compiling and doing our tests we felt like yeah. as if the machine was reflecting and giving inputs back to us. And right. yes, yes, if you see it, it was a very dumb way of putting it, right? Like, and we then finally coined it as a library of, instead of putting it in the respective parts of the code, we created a, a error management library. So it became like a reference library for the main code whenever an error came in. And we kept building that. And that became like a, a small, like an encyclopedia where... The, the messages became intelligent. So I don't know whether we can call it as an artificial intelligence, but there was certainly some, some level of intelligence that we fed in. That is how I put it. The system it. became a bit more intelligent in navigating the user by telling that you should have not done this. And consistently that journey kept going, right? Like even I'm, I'm, what I'm explaining is, is way back in 2003, that was my first project. 2003, my first job, my first, my first stuff, sort of. So move the needle to 2015, 10, 12, or 11, 12, sort of a time frame when analytics was the best, big thing. Okay, the, and uh, so in a way, if you look at it, right, like you are taking data to analyze and give recommendations. You are, like we, we have just conveniently forgotten all the recommendation engines, your intent-based searches. Uh, your Netflix rec- recommendation, your yes. uh, Amazon recommendations. Yeah. I mean, these are all things that you have lived for almost a decade now. Like your songs that you you that comes into your playlist, your YouTube recommendation engine. All these are based on some sort of AI, which which yes. is which is nothing but trying to help the customer 
or the user directly go to the area where they want where they are interested and if you extend that is what gen ai is slowly accelerating and now you suddenly are seeing i mean i would put it in uh, like this was the first time when you could why gen ai caught the attention of so many people is it's because it put it was more like a customized play that we are talking see even if you go to your recommendation engines and all right you are at the mercy of what is at the code that is being yes. you cannot today go and tell that uh, yes you can give the thumbs up thumbs down and all to make the algorithm better and all those stuff right but it was never like you go and tell hey you know what this list can you save it uh, uh, in in a very natural language you go and tell this li- list today that you gave me is fantastic can you just learn this uh, this way of showing me every every day when i wake up at 8 o'clock that the moment you give that flexibility is when people felt that you're connecting with another sort of an virtual assistant if i may call you are suddenly having a virtual assistant who is like a uh, i mean that's the word that they're using now right it's like co-pilot right like okay. you are now you are now going together sort of it is not like you are at the mercy of what is being thrown at you you have that power and slowly now this will accelerate because obviously the models are getting bigger the, they are getting more tailored so slowly you will see that the more the adoption things are just going to accelerate so that's how i would put it i mean long answer but i i just felt that ai is not just a spark that came the last few years it's it's been with us for a very long time and um, the use cases have been across the board to be very honest because you mentioned uh, a very pivotal meeting the dartmouth conference which happened in 1956 i read up about it because it's like the foundational uh, uh thing about that's kind of started ai the research and john mccarthy is considered to be the father of ai he is he was one of the scientists who coined the term ai because i read about yeah. it and then we we've, we've also seen the the fact that there's an llm called claud and that's named back to claud claud shannon he is the father of information theory is also part of the dartmouth conference yeah a lot of these uh, people coming together was the reason why we are seeing ai as in the in the face it is today so i had this uh, because you talked about uh, the fact that you experienced ai very early 20 years ago 2003 now for 20 years later when people you know you meet people in the tech industry you meet people at your company how has the perception of ai changed like has it changed a lot or uh, from what it was earlier or is it still evolving as was said in 2003 it's still the same like what is your perspective on that the perception of ai to be very honest i i i still believe that we have just scratched the surface of ai i mean if you i mean the experts usually are classifying ai into three major buckets right that is the first one which is called as the weak ai then there is the agi the general intelligence where you almost are at the capacity or mimicking a human completely and then there's the super ai which is like the the extreme i mean that's like superlative of uh, where our capabilities are so broadly these are the three major buckets that they keep talking about and you would be surprised uh, the branch we are still very much in vk <laughs> okay uh, gi is still decades away is what i'm hearing i mean i it's i get contradicting notes i i read uh, technical papers some people say it's a decade away some are like hey, it will take couple of decades and in some cases it's like few years is also being there but some people call it out that it could be in few years so there is a wide set of yeah, expectations and uh, uh, what is it theory going around there so leaving aside the other two that means we are still in a very weak ai kind of a mindset and that itself is creating so much buzz if you see like we we see unbelievable unimaginable things happening even within this uh, realm of what we call as peak ai right so let's not even i don't know what it will be like when it goes into the agis and the super ai the super ais of the world but where i'm coming from why i want to call this out is it is not like i think we have come a significant way in ai where we can pause and say hey you know what this journey has been so phenomenal example take some other industry right 
take the automotive uh, automotive industry okay we can say we have come a long way in that industry where i think some radical transformation if it has to happen it is now when people will see a car fly it it has come to that point it will not come to a point where if someone even today makes a car with an uh, like running on uh, like say water you still will yes there'll be great buzz around it but the fact will remain that many of the things that you currently use will remain the same you'll have tires you'll have wheel steering wheel you'll have uh, maybe a ai which is driving the autonomous vehicle the look and feel might be slightly different but the point where i'm coming is you are already come to a point where you have some standards established right and that will not give you like complete surprise it will not be you will not be completely surprised with that new product that might come and that's where the maturity has landed you after maybe what 19 19 so maybe it's around 100 100 plus years now for us unfortunately ai for us is still uh, and usually if you see the last 20 30 years is always the one where the acceleration happens on the evolution yeah. curve or the innovation curve right hmm the ai for us is we are pivoting actually from the last few years up until that time it was it was at a pace which was very uh, regulated customized a controlled environment uh, you didn't have ai at edge you didn't have like 1 billion 2 billion internet users trying to interact with a llm model i mean these are all things which we never even visualized when we used to be in tech space working on a project on a for a client maybe i was implementing some yeah, like analytical models their propensity to buy your smart pricing initiatives uh, your recommendation engines all these were within the big projects that technically people were working a, a revolution like what has happened in the last year comes in it now opens up avenues or opportunities which we never thought of and that is what is going to be very different because when you have more adoption you will unearth more problems yeah you you already have started hearing the the regulations and the, the data sovereignty correct the gdpr issues and all those kind of stuff right it will create it will create a new set of industry around like it will now create new companies you will have companies which will talk about uh, like i will validate your deep fake maybe mm-hmm. they'll become experts in deep fake because who validates videos going forward if it is so see where i'm coming from is we don't know how much this transformation is going to be because we just have very limited database to analyze at this point in time even though our llms are running on like petabytes of beta i don't know what level of data but still i think the user stories will come in the in the next 5 years you'll see phenomenal user stories starting to come and like i would like to call it more like you driving in the night right you you know you can see only as far as your headlight is projecting yeah. beyond that it is darkness so that is how it is like we are unearthing new things every 6 yes. months one uh, one month the pace is just alarming to be very honest i can't mm-hmm. keep up today i wake up and i see that the first uh, person who is can be technically called as a ai developer is coin i just told to my brother it's called devin devin right devin yes devin so devin is the first uh, person is, and i i was expecting this maybe a few months down the line and uh, i just woke up and i'm reading it so the pace is what is really fast that that means the pace of new user stories is just going to grow exponentially it's definitely going to grow exponentially and because uh just after open ai came out with chat gpt and all that you know that that ai was a black box sort of a thing We, most of us did not know what was happening inside that black box now it's like completely open we know what's happening in the world there's so much news around it and you know there's uh in the previous episode with one of my friends i was having this conversation so um his name is somil my friend he's yeah. building something around uh, a- interview prep with ai and we had the conversation that one day our avatars are going to talk to each other on a podcast it's going to be like an ai powered sort of a podcast and that's going to be the future probably the future is near and that's one of the versions of yeah. agi which you talk yeah. so as we speak i'm not sure if it's going to ever be possible i think it's going to be uh, going to come very soon like even within a year because as i see the development devin is here right and specifically uh, in a country like india where we almost a lot of times lag with tech 
we have an india ai mission which is uh, you know keeping 10000 crores for deep tech startups in ai that's a great move which is also happening so everything is moving at a really really fast pace up. so f- uh, and this has happened because of generative ai in the last one and a half years so on that yeah. note i would like to you to shed more light on yeah. generative ai now because yeah. we've talked about a bit about the history how you reached her what has been your experience in ai now what is generative ai from from a layman's perspective so see if you break it down let me stay away from the technical jargons because uh, i think that anyone can read uh, google or now you can interact with any of the gen ai tools now the buzzword is go and uh, check with chat gpt gemini llama or cloud anything right so that they, it, you can learn there practically you don't need me to explain the complicated stuff so see why did generative ai catch the attention and what is the under the hoods sort of stuff if you look at it what is happening so see we get bedazzled when uh we reach our destination faster that is that has been you you take any scenario right you always are you have this aha moment when you 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 can cut five or six steps and you directly land at your your uh, specific area at the core all these large language models it's it's like we used to have something called as cluster analysis back in the days when we had to look at customer uh, trends or we need to look at uh, the the buying patterns and all it was actually you, you you used to cluster things together like you when you plot it against multi take it against multiple uh, like two dimensional axis to start with simply i don't want to get into 3d modeling at this point let's take a two dimension even when you plot example a very simple data like the roles that you currently have let's put it at uh, the x axis and let's say the salaries that you get now if you had 10 data points it will be like scattered okay it will be all scattered and everyone will be like what is it it looks like just some random thing. make it 100 you will start and suddenly start seeing oh this makes some sense okay then you make it 1000 make it 10000 million and by the time you hit million right you will suddenly start seeing some huge clusters that form right you will see entry level people at some jobs with a, with some salary sets then you will see very few people at say very exact sort of presence at a very high level but that could be like the the aspiring situation where every the extreme right now where i'm going is you started getting a, a flavor of how data can be used to derive insights right? at the foundation of it llm or the all the gen ai stuff is about predicting the next your uh, uh, the keyword that you based like based on the intent it is predicting what could be your next word that is i mean if i have to oversimplify because what it is doing is when you train a model on let's say every data that is available on internet okay now when i showed you the model or the simple uh, model of analytics that i was talking about it had to be on a structured data set okay i had to have my database ready with everything which in a structured format it created plotted then it ran algorithms on it etc but imagine if you now have 10 to 15 different types of data you have telemetry data image voice like xml files are like i mean just name it everything that is stored in binary that let me make it that simple everything that is stored in binary if it becomes your holy grail to tap on and that is what is more like training your model on internet right what it does is it clusters your entire ecosystem with uh, and then it starts building that uh, what is it predictive uh, prediction of okay if this is what is my input prompt we have to even now we have to pass a prompt right without a prompt nothing is going to still work and that is what is the next level when agi comes in your interactions do not need a prompt apparently and uh, you can see elon musk is going towards that neuralink is is precisely yeah. going in that direction okay what if you yes. could mimic our we don't give prompts uh, to think for ourselves right we we do it yeah. seamlessly so not to digress from the topic but that is what is happening at the bare minimum so when you gave a prompt like let's take a simple example like mid journey a rabbit with blue eyes 
with Himalayas behind. It runs its imagination on these prompts. Like it, it goes back to its data to check, okay, what is a rabbit? Image recognition. It does image recognition. Now, rabbit for me means like this. Now it collects and brings a smaller set. Then it starts refining like, hey, there is a big eye sort of. So is it with... So what it, it practically is doing is it is creating that next layer of information based on your your sequencing or that is how it is working. It is creating... It's so fast that you can't appreciate it. But end of the day, that is how it lands and generates your, uh, you, your entire document or your entire... Uh, like uh, stable diffusion is for imaging. So it basically does layers of layers of cleanup of a, a particular uh, image to finally come and land and say that, you know what, this is what I think is the closest fit to the prompt that was given. And for us, it becomes an aha, right? Because it is like, I gave some five words and it came out like magic. And yeah. behind that, it has built this deep neuron network of uh, landing into the right set of data set and predicting what should be the next and keep repeating that. I was, mm. I think I was, I don't know who told this, but um, I was going through some uh, white papers and they were saying, actually the LLM models code is not humongous. I mean, I, I have done coding where the modules are, the code lines could be as much as 60,000 for one module multiplied by 20 modules, 100 modules. So it was like, huge list of codes that we used to write but i was surprised that when someone told that you know llm models don't have it, it's it's if i'm correct it's around fifty thousand to sixty thousand lines apparent i don't know the exact i can uh, we, uh, i'm not an expert there on coding front but that is how simple it is and you repeat it because the pace at which you repeat is what is making things come out in the way that we are seeing. So Gen AI for me is as simple as you mimicking the way uh, you're predicting your next word. As If I have to really come down to the base, it's it. predicting your next word, you're predicting your next, I'll not say photo or image, but it's more like your visual aid, right? Like it's what type of shape it is, what type of color it is. So it's it just keeps doing it uh, seamlessly and uh, ends up always many, I mean, apart from the hallucinations and others, it Correct. eventually lands at the right right data set that you want. You talked about the fact that, you know, generative AI is essentially a predictive model. It predicts the next, say, word or say, next image. At the center of it, at the core of it is a neural network. And mm -hmm. for most of us out there, we don't understand neural networks because it's, again, mm -hmm. tech terminology or it's like a black box. At a very mm -hmm. layman level, what is, what is a neural network from your perspective? See, um, it, it's one of the key principles on which I think even Gen AI was able, we were able to do what we are doing today. Because had we not mastered uh, how to build these mega neural networks, like huge neural networks, it would have been practically impossible for us to even visualize all the stuff that's happening. So let's let's maybe take roll it back in a very simple way so that leaving aside again the jargon. How do we... Uh, End of the day, neural networks wants to come as close as possible to the way that we think uh, as a human being, because that's that's the premise on which everything starts. Like, example, you have a piece of information. It has multiple pieces of information. It, it is one among, let's say, thousands of information that you are around. Now, for it to make sense, you you cannot look at it from a siloed perspective. You cannot just say that I will only be in this uh, uh, piece of information and make absolute sense. If you have to get complete picture, if you want to like predict, you want to identify what is uh, all the, uh, the analytical stuff, you have to start slowly interacting with the other set of data or the other significant uh, information that is around you there. And that for you is where the premise of neural networks starts. Now, let's take a simple example like what is happening with uh, your Google Maps. Like, uh, imagine you are you are thinking in your brain, I want to travel from here to drive from destination A to destination B. Now, what will your mind basically tell you? It's not going to just say randomly, it will not just tell that you can go and just uh, land in 
So it'll it'll plan it out, right? It'll say, okay, what type of uh, commute you're going to do, what type of that mode of transportation you're going to take. Once you decide that you are going to go and say, okay, now you're ta- you're thinking about flights. Are you going to go in a flight which is direct flight or a connecting flight? Where do you want? Uh, if there are multiple airports, where do you? So you see, right? It starts branching out, right? Like it, your thought process is branching. Out. Like yeah. it starts with one uh, one key task. And it starts branching out. You then say, okay, it's a flight, direct flight. Then it will lead you to like, hey, you know what, Vignesh, your experiences with these flights are like this. Uh, then your brain will tell, hey, I have always used Vistara. So you will tell that, okay, Vistara is my preferred one. Then your next question would come into picture saying that, Vignesh, you hated last time when it was very late and you had to take a... So you basically now plan your what time you want to be there. I can go endless now. To be honest, I can keep going until I am sitting in Goa, example, sipping my uh, like a beer or a, a juice in the beach, right? Because it can take you to that journey of deep thinking. Now, if I have to today write a, a very, um, let's say, a predictive model, like Vignesh is traveling from here to Goa, what is the likelihood of Vignesh landing in a beach and sipping a juice? That is what this neural network can predict because it has weights. What it does is it has weights. Vignesh's likelihood of taking Vistara is weighted. Vignesh's uh, preference to be in a morning flight is higher. Vignesh's preference to be in a specific chain of hotels is here. So that leaves me with five hotels there. He likes usually a resort which is by the beach. So that leaves us with two properties. And based on some other random inputs, it might finally come to a point where it will say, you know what, it is likely that Vignesh might be in this place doing this. And since you have trained it, if you just extrapolate it over my life, and that is where I'm telling you, right? Like if you take 45 years of my data and mimic it like internet, okay, now let's take internet as my my holy grail sort of. Uh, and you train it on, you build this massive neural networks on that particular data set. It is mm. scary sometimes because now it can predict Vignesh, what will what will Vignesh do in the next moment? Got it. Now, my the next statement that might come from my mind or from my what I'm going to spell out now, for all you know, in future, there might be a test where the, the, the machine can tell, see, Vignesh has been speaking, uh, going through this narrative. Based on this and the, the training that I've done, my deep, uh, I mean, my neural network that I've built, He's going to tell this sentence in the next two minutes. And that becomes scary, right? Because imagine um, if I can know what is Divyansh going to do tomorrow at nine o'clock and I can be there at that particular uh, spot. This is in a very layman term neural network. Uh, I mean, I'm not going into the technical jazz here because to achieve this, it is, uh, I mean, I've seen my data centers teams and the teams I have worked with, they optimize this interconnection to such an extent it is like a tough tough job to keep looking at the weights looking at what is the accuracy yeah. rates what needs to be a do and do they need to add new vector new new inputs to make it more uh like uh train it basically supervised yeah. training right and that yeah. was how the the magic of today is happening because of the hard work that the last decade of data scientists put together to build these massive neural networks and uh, because you mentioned this in such depth and you gave this example, this sounds so much like how humans learn and then predict, right? Exactly the way humans do. So neural network is like mimicking the human learning behavior and predicting behavior. So that's why they say it's like it's the human brain. And the fact that uh, it takes a lot of computation power as well. Can you throw some light? Because from what all I've learned in the past, say, six, seven months is that even if you, I, I'm not saying training in LLM is what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a huge thing right now because it takes so much hardware and all that stuff. From hardware perspective, computation perspective, um, what is needed like to for an AI to work, to function from a layman perspective again? What is required? Like the hardware is huge from what I see. Why is that? And from your perspective? See, because um, if I have to go to the bare metal conversation here right? see what is what is this all computing hap- what what is on the, the foundational but it is we just 
bits of data, right? Like uh, one and zero is what is flying around. And that is at the core what is being used to find logical solution. So when you deal with such level of data, obviously the chips that you're going to leverage, level of compute that you need to go in depth and try to analyze this data is humongous. I mean, let's be the amount of ones and zeros that are flowing today to even create one of your response from chat GPT could be like how much data was created in 1960s, entire globe it could be. That 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 is the level of data that we are talking about and bits that are flowing, right? And to handle that, everything is on steroids on the infrastructure side. Right. The, the All the chips that NVIDIA is bringing out, they are all tailor-made for these high computations that we really are going to, uh, we are experiencing, right? I mean, NVIDIA was more of a, uh, it was, so how it all started, if you look at it, right? Like, it's a very interesting story. They they were into gaming. They were heavy on gaming. They were heavy on visual aids. They, they, and those, again, bringing it back, dumb, let me dumb up my answer to help people appreciate what we are talking about. Imagine the good old days when we used to play games on our mobile, we still do. I don't have that privilege anymore. But when you play games, your your phone after one hour became like a pan, which was hot, yeah. hot pan. So that is, why, why is it happening? It's because your uh, Snapdragon microchip, which is inside, is basically like screaming its lungs out to process the amount of data or the, the information that is uh, required to pr- run a game almost uh, seamless and that's why those days you used to see a lot of lot of uh, uh, mobile phones talking about how cool their chips are mainly for videos and gaming and all right so that's how nvidia really be- found its niche then when people found that ability of gpus that they have the graphical processing units uh, from graphics it became into the they were heavily leveraged during the bitcoin revolution because end of the day, Bitcoin was, blockchain is more about encryptions and decryptions. So again, algorithms were run on those heavy duty AIs. And that set them beautifully for the, the, the compute power that we need for running these LLMs. And with this comes so much of power requirement, so much of pooling, the, the data centers that run these are state of the art. They have to be in a temperature controlled so yes, it, it 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 comes. That's the reason I would say NVIDIA is where it is. I mean, look at all the other companies. And yes. if you look at the, the, the company with the maximum stock rally, it is NVIDIA. It's an hardware yes. play that we are talking about. Uh, and obviously, it is not, they are not just purely in hardware. They have software on huge uh, investments on software and uh, em- uh, embedded on their AI chips. But net-net, without that compute, there was no open AI. There, there is no Gen AI. Mid journeys will crash. No yeah. Gen uh, like text to audio, video, Sora will not work. Mm. Nothing will work. So it's like the engine which which has to fire, and it is just going to get more and more complex because the expectations are going to be higher. And do you think so? Uh, because Nvidia is doing so well right now because of the boom. Do you think a revolution in hardware is imminent, or is it still far away? Like looking at what's happening right now terms of tech yeah so that leads to one of the questions that people are heavily i mean they are actually pondering on right like see at some point in time conventional compute will max up i mean all the chip designs that we are currently doing i'm no check chip expert uh, please don't uh, like uh, hold me here but based on what i read right like beyond a point in time the optimization that we currently have on the chip you can't i mean people keep asking uh, we, we very casually ask this question. Okay, make bigger chips. Why can't you just, uh, that can do more, right? Like, no, it doesn't work like that, apparent. So to work efficiently, it has to have some critical dynamics, which will eventually limit the number of uh, compute or transistors that can go into that space that you have for the chip. And at that point in time, yes, what will you do when you run out of your conventional way of compute. Somehow, I think people have already f- figuring it out. Quantum computing is something that has been 
caught the, mm-hmm. it's catching the attention and make no mistake like uh, I, I i keep hearing some uh, random uh, videos are uh, surfacing where people openly claim that ca- ca- quantum computing will be 100 times faster than 1000 times faster than conventional computing without understanding the the foundation of it right like again these are not comparable traits it's mm-hmm. like you comparing a jet speed of a car with that of a aeroplane it is not fair because it is as as you said even though both of them come under the bigger umbrella called as transportation industry but they are completely different platforms that we are talking about right and it might be very similar because conventional computing is based on a very very simple uh, philosophy that a bit which will exist either in a it's it's binary it is like a switch right it is one or zero that's it and all the compute that we are doing is based on this uh, switches that keep going into one and zeros and that's how it works but qubit or the quantum computing is not a enhancement on top of this technology or this conventional way of computing. it is altogether a new way of looking i i still remember when people told right what was the biggest achievement right brothers gave when we flew not more than 200 feet right uh, in their first flight it is so inspiring to think it in from this perspective for the first time in human or in your in in, the, in our history we had access to a different di- uh, like a different uh, dimension that right. is how it was put up until time we just didn't explore the vast area that we had above us because it was non existent for us yeah. and that is where this like when qubits become another way of computing quantum okay. is nothing but it can again quantum is so complicated i am i, I might have just scratched 0.1% of it uh it just basically means that you don't need to be either a zero or a one at the same time you can be a zero and a one in a with in a varied proposition oh. so you could be tending to 20% towards zero and 80% towards say one and this qubits when they uh, come together okay let me not go too deep on that so <laughs> what what qubit uh, what uh, quantum computing does is necessarily is not a, a step on building on conventional uh, compute it is opening up a new highway it is going to bring its own set of uh, rules and regulations infrastructure it is it is not your your quantum qubits will be like become useless if it is not under a controlled ecosystem so the investments are happening on specific temperatures sub zero temperatures only they are stable so it has to be built in under that controlled environment the only advantage that you have divyansh in that as i'm reading more and more is if you took thousand steps to reach the answer in our conventional way qubit can do that in 100th or 1 wow. 200th of that step okay because it can capture data inside it to that magnitude because of the state that it has there are a lot of uh, theories around it you can read about it uh, how interference happens how the other uh, i mean there are basic philosophies around uh, q- uh, quantum computing you can always google that but the idea is the amount of information that it can hold at any particular point makes it easy for it to derive the answer in two three steps whereas a conventional computer would have taken maybe 200 steps it's natural if you are going to take 200 steps even even if you're faster than like say the the uh, quantum computer it is going to take more so mm. that is the philosophy by no means people have proved that the ai chip here or say the chip in conventional computing with that of quantum computing like apple to apple something is it cannot be that because end of the day as i said right you are comparing a diesel engine with that of a Uh, ram jet it's not possible so right just that now you you can process things at a scale where you have never visualized and you can come to answers in two steps one steps and it is a challenge because some of the problems that it is solving example decrypting a highly sophisticated password as highly as breaking into a secure password zone apparently the quantum computers are able to do that in seconds okay because Crazy. they are able to get to that that's the point right so in foreseeable future i see that there will be two sets of like how aeroplane didn't kill our car industry right they still drive it's you can always say if, uh, if i can reach uh, from destination a to b in one hour using my flight why should car exist then it doesn't work like that right you need your cars you need 
So, end of the day, you will find two sets of uh, compute might exist in future. The best way to derive an answer is dependent upon the use case. You don't want to run everything on quantum because that's not what quantum will be built for. It is, it is, it is going to solve very complex problems. It's going to solve, I mean, it's interesting. Some of the use cases that they're projecting is what is beyond uh, wormhole. Like uh, what's inside wormhole, if you have to really compute it, you need, you can't do it with convention, con a conventional compute. It has to be something enhanced and maybe the answer is quantum. Who knows? What do you think about how soon is quantum computing coming into the world? I think it's like three, four, five years. Even uh, currently we have, as we speak, we have quantum computers. Like it is not even like in closed labs. It, yeah. it, it is it is not commercialized. Yes, it is not available for us to use it in our conventional computers. But big players, big corporations, few of them have already cracked it and they have their quantum computers. And that is the basis on which we, all these data sets and all these analysis is being brought out. In fact, the research is uh, like happening even at like big countries, like yeah, the countries who are leading the tech revolution know that this is like, as I said, right, this is going to add a new dimension that we never had. So it yeah. has to be built. It, it, it has to be built. If you don't know what is going to hit you, you will never be prepared for it. So that's the reason uh, people are in, investing significantly on this. The challenge as of now is the consistency with which you can uh, derive data from the state. The state collapses if it is not uh, controlled in the right way. So that is why it is not as robust as what, like how we carry our uh, laptops and phones, right? Because we are, we know that they work under this environment. That level of consistency has not been landed is what I'm reading. I think it, it's just a matter of time. I think it's just a matter of time that we, we land with one of the quantum companies. Interesting. And I think in the previous conversation which we had, we talked about something called as SLMs, which is small language models. Um, language models that will run on our devices, which is on the edge, edge computing. We won't need the cloud all the time to do the processing. What's your perspective on that? SLM, are they already, I think they're already in development. I saw a few of them, GPT, Neo and all that. So yeah. what's the potential with SLMs? See, to be very honest, I think the, the LLMs were more of eye-catching big boys. Okay, Like it was like uh, uh, the aircraft car carriers of the defense, right? like Navy sort of, the big boys in the sea sort of. But eventually your strike force will be defined by very nimbler units. Okay, that's how it is. Like you can't always bring the, the big boys in reuse use case. So SLMs, as the word is like, it's, it's a small language. A model, right? Like, and it is tailor made for your use use case. And as and when you start, and it's not just one field that is actually coming up. SLMs, uh, reinforced augmented generation, which is RAG, all these are new uh, algorithms that basically are going to optimize the way we are going to use the LLMs that we are using currently. Like, we throw everything at the LLM, and we we are now just trying to optimize it and Eventually, cost will come, price will come, it will start biting, you will you will start understanding that you have to optimize it. After all the initial hula, who, who and on settles down, suddenly someone will raise and say that, hey, you know what, we have burnt so many millions trying to hit this model. The results need to be more richer, more tailor-made. The same result that is applicable for uh, health fitness use case might not be relevant for critical illness, example. Uh, and uh, so all these becomes extremely critical uh, and that is when SLM, SRAG, all these concepts will come in because they will tailor your, your use case and make them more faster, nimbler, more relevant and optimize it from a cost angle also. Then that is when the adoption starts picking in, right? Because then people get confidence and all those stuff starts. In the foreseeable future, Divyans, that is what is going to happen. I think... Uh, uh, we'll see a lot of such uh, tailor-made solutions, which are the SLMs, RAG implementation on top of your LLMs. Uh, everything basically will be the driving force. And because you mentioned use cases of SLMs and probably requiring less computation power and being more accessible to a lot of people, what do you think are the most interesting use cases from your view? Yeah, I think, see, all, uh, I think I wrote about this yesterday in my uh, my LinkedIn post, right? See, at some point in time beyond, you have to move from reasoning to action because end of the day, all this work that you're doing in LLM is more on reasoning, predicting what is going to happen, what is my next word, all these stuff. But 
even now your your L- strongest of llms will give you a recommendation and the implementation or the actioning on that is left to you as a human to do now that is where lambs will start coming right large action models where now imagine the integration that happens between these two like that is when the true jarvises of the world if you are an avenger fan right you will you, yeah. the jarvises of the world will happen because who knows in another 10 years you might have some one like a jarvis at home a hologram sort of which keeps behind you with your smart lens you are the only person who can see it and uh, you can constantly interact using a neural neural link type of a communication with them it's like hey you feel very depressed today i mean imagine the conversation it was a tough day in office for you do you think you should go and i would recommend you go and have some chill time here and you are like okay i think i should and then it says you know what i have 15 options for you. it's it's all like flashes running in your brain right like I think you should go to this place today it has a great karaoke night and maybe you might want to scream your lungs out there. So this is a end use case that we might land in where people it's scary and be honest because ideally I would want to do that conversation with my wife or my kid because you want physical forms to be around you but it could become that co-pilot uh, the Jarvis for Iron Man sort of a scenario or Friday at the end game it basically is going to be with you take care of you and uh, hopefully it doesn't go rogue and makes you something which is not you but if you keep it under that uh, your conscious levels it could add so much value because you don't current things that you do i need to pay my bill i need to do this i need to learn this i need to it can read a book compile it for you overnight and just give you the snippet the next day morning read that so it can happen it can happen who knows all these are That's why I said we are scratched just the surface. The user stories can just—it's like wild imagination. Sorry to say that it—it it could be. I can just go as crazy as I want. I can see that uh, sort of the conversation that you talked about large action models. Probably GPT five six will go in that direction somewhere. Not sure. I'm just guessing. Yeah. See, see, it's and, good. It could. Uh, yeah. Rabbit came out with uh, one of its uh, small devices. Right. That's where they're building. Uh, uh, but. technically yeah. yes i think uh, uh, someone building a llm might always be interested in a lamb also and who knows how these things might come together mm. because you said large action models and the fact that they perform actions the last question that i have from you is that what do you think ai is are going to become conscious like human level conscious um, that's scary that's a scary future but do you think that that can happen because somebody pointed out in the dartmouth conference somebody did point out that this can happen way back in 1956 which i read about so what do you think i don't think they were wrong in predict i don't want to disappoint people by telling that uh, human machines can never come to that think about it in this way the range what is missing today from if i if i analyze it's it's about that human feel that get off the emotions mm. the conscious mm. that we all are so proud of right yeah now let's break it down into one use case and then check i mean again it all comes down finally to you going to the bare minimum bare metal equation now let's take a simple emotion of yours let's say anger or fear now that emotion what is it it is an outcome of multiple inputs that you felt at that point fear example it could be that a state or a equilibrium you are in a equilibrium and there are some 12 parameters and now i'm going into math mode so that you understand how your fear comes in there could be 15 for maybe for you for me it could be 25 parameters which define fear now if one of that parameter becomes significant or goes out of sync you experience something which is uh, out of state sort of a feeling and that basically makes you feel that i i'm scared it could be like a dark uh, alley uh, which you're staring your visual aid is giving that input that oh it's so dark something could be there and that triggers that fear emotion in you now what stops a machine from behaving like that in future when they built that kind of a neural network where they have their own way of building the equilibrium status and they go into an uncomfortable situation every time one of that equilibrium is disturbed one of the factor is disturbed disturbing the equilibrium and how they will react to the fear is the question like every time if there is a self correcting mechanism and that is what is the emphasize now right you are 
going into a mode where machines are going to do tasks thousands of times eliminate it is going to do eliminations and then finally land one way of doing it correct so and it is tireless right like human being it will not leave it will keep repeating like a dumb box it will keep doing and it will keep eliminating so eventually it will know that this state is disturbed i need to sense it could not be the fear that we have as fear it could be some other way of expressing and it yeah. might have a remedial action that is the worrying part like to correct that to bring it back to equilibrium status mm. today when you have fear you t- you hit a torch light or you switch on the light that is your yeah. way of eliminating a dark darkness fear what will its reaction be to come back to equilibrium is something we don't know and okay. it might happen that is why i feel that when people scream that hey guys take it slow analyze think what is happening we don't want to overlook what that side of the yeah. was shouting at also because we don't want to be creating an enigma code machine where we don't know what it is communicating and then we are trying to decode that conversation so it is interesting it is sometimes scary uh, as you pointed out divyansh but i feel it is it was not a wild imagination it can can very well happen as what i feel. Superb, sir. I think uh, that perspective kind of concludes this episode as well. You've given a great insight into the world of AI, generative AI, and your experience as well on the episode. I'm thankful to you for for coming on the show and on the podcast and sharing your insights. Thank you so much for for coming here. No worries. Always a big fan of people who want to learn. So thanks for asking some great questions here, Dhuvansh. Because to be honest, it just Uh, it was it was a great set of questions that brought out a good conversation thank you so much thanks for having me most welcome sir thank you have a great okay. evening